Okay, so I'm going to get our PowerPoint back up here. So, what do you do? So, you know, I, I have to say, one of the things we do is we never expect a cookie cutter job. And this is a great example. You get kind of thrown a curveball. And um, because wildlife and animals, they don't read textbooks. You know, we can approach a job in a textbook fashion. And then the next thing you know, you realize the animal didn't read the textbook and you gotta, you gotta think and do it differently. So anyways, so this, uh, so thank you, Aaron, so much for getting us back online here. Um, so, so what we do is we're gonna be help, we're, we help uh, homeowners humanely solve wildlife concerns. Um, we're providing humane removal and we're also, um, uh, one of the services that we do is we uh, wildlife proof decks and porches uh, to prevent wildlife from getting under there. So what we don't do is we're not trapping and killing animals that are considered a pest. So this goes back to a comment. I don't know if you heard what I said earlier in the, in the earlier, but we can hire a pest control company to come out, trap an animal, and take it, and they're usually dispatching that animal afterwards, which means they're killing the animal afterwards. Um, we don't always assume that the animal that the homeowner is seeing is the same animal that's creating the damage. So a typical job would be somebody sees squirrels. Oh, what? Sometimes I'll oh, get a call and they'll say, I definitely have squirrels. And then Joanne goes and looks. It turns out it's mice or something. And so that's where Triana and Joanne have to kind of figure out what's happening, how big the holes are, what does the scat look like, and then find the solution. Kathy says animals are not pests. This is true. <laughs> we agree. We 100% agree. Um, so the other thing that we don't do is we don't relocate wildlife. So if you have a raccoon in the attic space um, that ripped through the gable of your attic to get in there um, for a female to have her young in there, we're not relocating her. We're not taking anybody off their off the their, out of their territory. So we're working with the homeowner and solving the problem how to wildlife proof your home. So we're not relocating animals either. Some people think uh, relocating an animal is a humane option, but often uh, it doesn't end well for the animal and a new animal just moves in. Which maybe Triana can talk yeah. about the vacuum effect. Definitely, so vacuum effects, um, what that means is if you are removing an animal from their living space, so if they have found a nice warm spot under your deck that they're now living under, if you remove that animal um, and you leave that space vacant, you're just gonna have another friend that's gonna move right in. It's just the perfect spot. It's ready to go. Nobody's living in it anymore. So they're gonna move right in. So that's basically what the vacuum effect is. This actually also um, goes with feral cats. We see yes. this with feral cat populations. If people want to remove feral cats from their uh, surrounding area, you'll just see more cats come into that area. So it's very similar with wildlife. Um, so removing the animal actually doesn't fix the problem. It's just opening up that spot for a new friend to move in. So when, uh, so if, so let's say uh, there's a, an adult raccoon in the attic space and somebody comes out, traps the, traps the mom, takes it away. And then, so what else happens? when trapping and relocating is um, young or orphan. So this is a photograph uh, from a job that we did. 
um, where that, that exact thing happened. Mom was trapped and removed. And then all of a sudden, Young started coming out through the vent above the driveway and dropping down the side of the house into the driveway. And I don't know if anybody knows what kind of little hands these are, um, but these were, um, these are little raccoon hands. Um, so there was, there were several raccoons, baby raccoons that were orphaned in the attic space after mom was trapped and taken away. And then they, they found their way out to a vent from the side of the house from the attic. And so when we have situations like that, we work with uh, licensed wildlife rehabilitators around the state, and we will contact them and let them know that we have baby squirrels, maybe baby skunks, maybe raccoons that are orphaned. Um, and so then we work with them, we work with the licensed wildlife rehabilitators, and we transport those animals to them so that they can be raised and be put back out to the wild. And our hope as uh, part wildlife removal is we don't have those situations arrive because we will not suffer the mother from her young. So this was a, 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 um, a scenario that we had where there was a mom with some, with some kits, baby kits in the attic. This little kit fell down into the wall and the homeowners could hear the baby crying inside the wall. So, um, so we went, drilled a hole in the wall and through the sheetrock, and then was able to pull that baby out of the wall. And so that's, uh, that's the little baby raccoon that we pulled out of the wall. And then from there, what we did was we put that little baby in a nest box on, um, on the roof where mom was going in and out of a gable. We also collected up her other babies put them all in the nest box together and we sealed up the gable. And then we put out a wildlife camera and it documented mom coming back and taking each one of her young to a different den site. Interesting fact about raccoons is one raccoon has been shown to have 39 dens within a three block area. So we're talking about going from 39 to 38 by taking away uh, a den in an eye. So this is a this can be a common occurrence where um, people are getting work done on their house on the exterior part, maybe getting some eaves repaired, and then animals become trapped inside uh, inside the interior of the walls. So we got a call about uh, a bird that was stuck in a wall. Um, so I did the same thing, went out, got permission, drilled a hole in the wall. Um, big enough to allow the pigeon to come through, gave it a couple of days, the pigeon came out the hole, and there it was in the, in the person's room, and then, uh, then they just opened the window and the bird was able to get out, and then the, the wall was just packed. Yeah, so this is wildlife proofing. Yeah, sure. So one of the most important rules is that we do not touch the wildlife. Um, so that goes for customers, people that are calling us, and um, anybody that's working in the field. Uh, we're trying our hardest to not touch these wild animals. Right, so this is kind of um, an idea of basically just um, an average home and the kind of areas that you might be looking at that you know certain animals can pick their way in. So, uh, gables are definitely known for raccoons and squirrels making their way up into your attic. Uh, so this is kind of a little diagram of the different types of animals that we have here in the Vermont area and who might be taking advantage of certain areas of your home. And this is another example. Um, we always talk a lot, um, especially around this time when it is cold out, when we're seeing a lot of mice coming into your home. Um, <laughs> It is very common to see mice inside when it starts to get cold. They are looking for shelter, just like us. So one thing that you are looking for when you are looking outside of your home is um, any small opening that they could fit through. You can actually see there's a, a dime right there on the screen. And a mouse can actually fit right through any hole the size of a dime, um, sometimes even a little bit smaller, depending on the size of the mouse. 
Um, so they can really fit into any little crevice. If you have wires that are coming out of your home or tubes or pipes, making sure that all of that is stuffed with um, steel wool, which definitely works as a little photo of steel wool there. Um, you could also use other type of packing material that they can't chew through, but it's really important to stuff up all of those areas to prevent any small critters from entering your home. And then that also goes for the inside of your home as well. So what we see often are interior pipes underneath your sink um, in the bathroom or in the kitchen. Um, you will see kind of a, a cutout hole where those pipes are coming to and from um, the area. And that often is, you know, left a pretty big gap. So you want to fill those spaces as well with that steel wool. And that will prevent entry into underneath the cabinets, which is definitely an, an issue in my house. Um, or um, in your, your silverware drawers. And um, same goes for the wires. If you're having any wires going through um, walls, making sure that all of that is also sucked up. Often when people call in, um, they're asking, you know, what can I do to get this skunk out from under my deck? First thing we always say is animals are looking for a dark, quiet place to den. So can we take that away from them? And that will help encourage them to move on. So a talk radio is helpful under your deck. Um, motion lights that um, go on when they're coming and going. What we want to do is encourage them to say, hey, this isn't the best place to den. Take away that food, um, any garbage, or if you're feeding your cats or dogs outside, make sure you take all that away. Something else that we actually did for fun this um, past summer was we were using uh, wind, little windmills oh, uh, with pinwheels, those pinwheels that you can stick out in the garden when the wind blows. Um, that's like an emotion that um, will oftentimes scare away. Uh, woodchucks is a big one. They don't love that motion. So um, that's a really great way to keep critters away from decks and, and such. Balloons and we use those so, so, um, so the idea is uh, uh, you can also use balloons uh, filled, filled with some helium. You can go to the party store, get some balloons. And um, uh, the minions are pretty popular. So what you're looking for um, is you're looking for a balloon that's got big eyes on it. Because big eyes mean that that is a predator. So. So when you're scaring away animals like the wood trucks or the rabbits from the garden or in an entry point, putting a balloon out there, let it bounce around in the wind. And then with those big eyes, the, the prey species, the rabbits and the wood trucks will, will move off to somewhere else and find another place to live. So balloons actually work well and they're fun. <laughs> So this is actually a photo of a wildlife job that was done. You can see that there's hardwire mesh. That's that metal mesh part that you're seeing this pearl standing next to. So this little guy was, I believe this is under a porch, mm -hmm. under a porch. Yeah. And um, he is no longer allowed under the porch because we have wildlife proof that deck and um, there is no longer an entry point to that. So he's on the outside and he can't get back in. This is kind of showing you uh, the way that we use that hardwire mesh. Um, so this is a diagram uh, that is showing uh, placing the hardwire mesh on the area at the bottom of the porch or the deck um, that is open. And then you'll want to bury um, and line the bottom at least 12 inches, yeah, 10, to 12, 10 yeah. to 12 inches. And that will prevent them from burying underneath to get underneath that hardwire. Um, I believe recent studies have shown that you actually don't have to bury the wire yeah. um, as long as it's about 10 to 12 inches um, away from the structure. That should be enough to prevent them from burrowing back under. Uh, all right. All right. Yeah. You want to go? Okay. okay. So um, this is the one way door that we kind of uh, looked at a little bit in the beginning here. We do use these quite often. So uh, what we were talking about in terms of getting a raccoon out of an attic or getting you know, the skunk from underneath your deck, we will surround the structure with a hardwire mesh, only leaving one exit point where we'll attach a one-way door. 
So this metal door allows the animal to exit from that area, but they can't get back in. Is this show the movie? Oh, um, no, it's on okay. that video coming up soon. Okay. So um, that is something that we use very frequently here with our humane evictions. And this is a great way that we can remove the animal without touching the animal, which we had discussed a little earlier. And we can't do it when it's baby season. So we won't have a mother, kick the mother out, leaving young behind. That's just not what we do. We have to do it after the young are out and about. So, um, so chimneys, and we've been talking a lot about gables, but chimneys are also, um, uh, an entry point for raccoons and squirrels. Now, when you think about an animal squeezing through something, you'll see that raccoon is just peeking out through that, that the slots of the gable. Um, to give you an example, gray squirrels only need two inches to fit through. Like we were talking about earlier, the mice only need the size of a dime. Gray squirrels need about two inches. Raccoons and skunks, we've seen them on video fitting through like three to four inches. So they're not made like us. If we get our head into something, our shoulders block us. If they can get their head into something, they're amazing. They can squeeze their bodies and like shimmy through areas. Um, and if you're uncertain about if an animal is coming in and out of a, an area in your home, especially if it's up high, um, you can see this raccoon entry point, all the smudge marks on the bottom of the gable there on the siding. And that's an indicator that an animal is coming and going from an area because that's the oil from the fur. So, and the, there, there and the been, uh, we have wildlife cameras that will set up to see who's coming and going from a place. And there have been times where I'm looking at a video and I'm thinking it can only be a chipmunk that's in such a small area. And a uh, skunk full body will just press itself right underneath there and get under the deck. So it's pretty amazing what they can do. Mm -hmm. This is a great video that uh, shows the hard work of the team <laughs> out in the field. Mm -hmm. So here they are setting up, you have to build it by hand a lot of the times, and so they are building by hand the one-way door and the connection to um, evict that uh, raccoon from that chimney. So um, birds and dryer vents and bathroom vents, this is really common. Um, and if you don't, uh, if your vents don't have a basket cap on it, like in the bottom right hand part of the, of the slide, um, birds will lift up those levers and, and fly in there and make a nest. And starlings particularly will come back year after year after year. So what they're doing is every year they're building a new nest in that same vent. So they will totally clog up a vent. Um, so it's always important to make sure your vents are clean every, every year or two, and also to make sure that they're capped. Um, and if you're concerned about if a bird is using a vent on the side of your house with these kind of levers that they can just push up and go in, um, you'll usually see nesting material hanging out of the, the vent, and you'll see bird droppings down the side of the structure. So this was a, a scenario where there was um, some bird eggs and a mother bird nesting in a very um, unsafe area. Um, potentially, when the birds would hatch, they would um, when they would when they would fledge and come out of the out of the nest when they were fledging, um, they would potentially be hit by a car, um, and the homeowner was very concerned. So we went out, um, we gathered up the nest, we made a nest. For it and then hung it in the tree that was right there. Um, and a lot of people um, will think that birds, if you handle them, the birds will not come back to take care of them. But uh, it's my understanding that a lot of the birds can't smell. So um, 
So there's no actual proven science, you know, science any kind of science that says that if you handle them, the mom won't come back. They, she will come back or the parents will come back and they'll continue to care for their nest or their young. So um, securing, uh, making sure that gables and windows are secured. Uh, the bottom left or the left photo, that's insulation. So if you imagine being in an attic, you know, you have that, um, you have that fiberglass insulation, it's usually pink or yellow. Uh, this is where a squirrel took that, shredded it all up and made, it, and made a nice den out of it in somebody's attic. And in the middle of it, towards the bottom, you'll see like a little hole. And that's where the squirrel was living. These were red squirrels. And you can see the damage that they did to the screen on the gables to gain entry. So another common area is soffits and fascia boards. Um, squirrels will, squirrels and raccoons will take advantage of these. Uh, anywhere where there's wood on the side of a structure that's starting to get soft, squirrels will usually know that and they'll start chewing at it and they'll make holes bigger to get in there and set up a home. So when we're working with in these, in these kinds of scenarios, um, this particular uh, soffit area uh, and fascia board, there was a family of squirrels in there. So we moved them all out and we set up a squirrel box in the tree that was right there next to the home. And we put everybody in there and gave them an option to, to live there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so skunks and window wells, we do see this frequently. Um, if you have a home and you have a window well that isn't covered, this is a common occurrence. Skunks actually don't see very well. Uh, they're, they're, not very, they're not very good at seeing. So if you have an uncovered um, window well, they can oftentimes fall in and they don't have any way of getting back out. So oftentimes we'll get a lot of phone calls with people that don't know what to do because they have a skunk that is stuck your window well. So the best thing to do is to make sure that those window wells are capped uh, to prevent any small animals from falling in. Um, you'll see on the left hand side uh, there were some boards that were placed there on an angle and that will allow the skunk to make his way out on his own um, and that way they can you know quickly patch up that window well to prevent that from happening again. Mm -hmm. If a bucket is there, um, if that's not working, you can use a bucket with a handle on it and a string. You put some tuna, something yummy in the bottom, and put it down in. And then when the skunk crawls in, then you pull the whole bucket out and set it on the ground beside. So this is really common. We get a lot of calls about um, particularly raccoons and dumpsters. Um, generally, if this happens, if you live in an apartment complex or somewhere and there's an animal stuck in a dumpster, because what happens is they're used to going in that dumpster all the time to get food. But right after the trash company comes and empties it, they go back in that next night to get some more to, to eat again, and then they're stuck because the trash isn't filled up for them to get out. So what we do is we place a board in there. So if you have a two by four, or something, you can put that in the dumpster. Sometimes people will use a branch that's laying on the ground and put that in for the animal to get out. And, um, and then this is a little video. This actually is a video right here outside the Cubane Society's dumpsters. You can see we do frequently get some raccoon visitors in our dumpsters here. Um, as you can imagine, our dumpster has a lot of really yummy stuff in it with our cats and dogs and small animals. So we did place a board in there. You can see all the stuff moving at an angle. That will allow these guys to leave on their own. So oftentimes you will actually hear, well, I put the board in, but nobody's leaving. They're staying in there. I don't know, they might be sick. Um, but they'll actually leave on their own time. Most of the time they are a little nervous, it's light. Um, they're not used to being outside during this time of day. So they might actually wait until it gets a little darker out where they feel a little bit safer to um, escape. Yeah. And, if, and if you do have concerns, it's summertime and they're in there and it's hot and it's a big metal dumpster, you can, you can like hoist down a, a, um, a dish of water or you can offer them like watermelon 
or cantaloupe for them to kind of eat and, and get some nutrition. And then just on top of that, if you do have a dumpster problem there, uh, making sure uh, that it is completely, um, you know, the door on our dumpster has a little hole in it, which is a great way for uh, those raccoons to get in and out of there. So just making sure that the door is completely sealed and that they're locked at night because they are great at opening doors, especially dumpster doors. And even just at homes with smaller dumpsters, they will get in there as well. Um, bungee cords can be effective to help keep them out. There's no information. Yes. So that's that's our presentation. Thanks for um, sticking with us through the technical difficulties. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And um, if people have questions, where did the raccoon go from there? Uh, Holly asks. We don't know. I mean, we assume we're we're around a lot of woods here in South Burlington. So my assumption is that they are in one of their many dens that are in the area here. Uh, we also have a little feral cat community back there. So we do regularly have a little cat food. Um, so they all enjoy all of that back there. It's a great place to be a raccoon. Does anyone have any questions? I mean, oh, I mean the the one O oh, within the slack. Oh, the one no, that, was that a picture that you took? Yeah. Oh, 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 no, I didn't take that photo, but that's a very common, that's a very common thing that happens, but I, I have, no, I did not take that particular photograph. Yeah, Kathy, go ahead. Your question is somewhat complicated. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I, I will just um, ask it, yes. and I, I, can I, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, I can see you. But you can't hear me? I can't hear you though. Huh. <laughs> I'm off We're of always mute. having technical difficulties, aren't we? <laughs> I can hear you. I'm off of mute. Do you have to put me off of mute? Oh, I can, I think I can hear you, Kathy, now. Okay, maybe you had to take me off mute. Wonderful. Okay, I, first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much. This, I've written down a lot of things and it's been a very informative uh, presentation. And I have previously called um, Heart Wildlife and you've been just absolutely wonderful. You took a lot of time with me. We live in a log cabin in Williston and we have lots of visitors all the time. <laughs> And we have had a problem with mice. And I think we've we've done pretty well with that for two reasons. We took down all the pink insulation in our basement. And what we did is we moved our bird feeders further away from the house. So they're quite far now. But that has caused, caused us additional um, problems in that we have had a pack of wild turkeys, about 15 of them, that although we've had wild turkeys in the past, they usually come in the fall and then they leave. These guys have stayed and they continue to come because I think we're, the feeders are far enough away from the house that they continue to just feel comfortable. And I try and scare them away at certain times, but they continue to come back. And in addition to the wild turkeys now, I think they have attracted a um, coyote who comes about seven o'clock in the morning and scouts out the wild turkeys. And I think he's kind of scouting out his territory and I try and scare him away too. But I'm wondering if you have any suggestions. That's my first question. My second question would be, do you ever come out just to do like an evaluation of the house with some of the problems that you talked about so that we can be a little bit more proactive and take care of some of these things. So thank you very much. And I'll put myself back on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. So as far as the attraction of the animals, the, the wild turkeys and the coyotes, um, honestly, I, I think the, the thing to do is to remove the food source for a little bit. You know, give it a, remove the bird feeder, um, bring it in for a while, maybe a couple of weeks or something. So the animals don't get habituated and used to having a food source there because that's what's attracting them. So. So if you think the bird feeder is what's attracting them, then I would just remove that for a little bit and then they'll, they'll move off and they'll go on. And I'll let Patty answer your other question. Well, on the mice um, situation, a lot of the times when 
mice have taken hold in the house, the kind of the best deep dive idea is doing weatherizing. It sounds crazy, but all the air that comes in and out of our houses and all of our heat that we lose, uh, mice are using those same holes as well. And I did a weatherization upgrade on my house and then I dragged Joanne in to help me because we had mice before. And then once all the weatherizing was done, the spray foam and things like that, um, Joanne and I then live trapped um, the mice that were caught on the inside and then took them to the outside and touched wood eight years later, I haven't seen them out. So, and, but it all depends. If you've got a stone foundation or something like that, it's hard going. Um, you know, mice is a, is a challenge. So what was the second question? Did you do consult? Yeah, yeah, on souls, yeah. Joanne will come out um, and take a look at. Do you remember that picture with all the different areas around the house? So come and evaluate all of that and talk to you um, just about what you can do, like the window wells, like Priyana was mentioning, chimney, getting a cap on that, all those things. And um, uh, Kathy asked, what about her cardinals? Is there maybe another place that she can put her bird feeders or? Well, and you can or, do it after the season where we're kind of, they're struggling for food. So you mm -hmm. could, you know. Yeah, I mean, they, they do make uh, some feeders that catch the seed. So that could be an option. Um, so you're still able to put your feeder out, but it's going to catch that seed so it's not falling to the ground. Um, and the only other option is to be very, very meticulous about cleaning up the seed every day. Um, so it's just a matter of, yeah, getting that, making sure that that's not hitting the ground. And if it does, it's cleaned up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kathy. Great question. Thank you. Any other questions? Anything to add? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, there's a couple of species. Uh, that, um, that I particularly think are, are kind of unique uh, and interesting, and one is skunks. Mm -hmm. um, skunks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach a, a, a song about skunks. <laughs> and basically, um, when people see skunks, they get really frightened about them. Um, and as Triana said earlier, they can't see very well, but they can hear really well. So when you see a skunk outside, um, and if it's just waddling around looking for grubs, because they're going to be eating the grubs out of your lawn and they're going to be eating the mice that are around. So they're providing free grub and rodent removal. Um, it just happens they're a little stinky. So, so with skunks, they can't see, but they can hear. So when you see one, this is what I tell people to do. You sing happy birthday to yourself out loud, but softly. So, so you want to do it like this. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. So what it's doing is it's causing it, it's the skunk can hear you and has the opportunity to just waddle off. And then for you, it makes you feel silly. And then it's creating you to breathe because you're singing. And so you're taking that deep breath. And so that's calming for the person. Um, you can do that with dogs, too. You can do it with any kind of animal because it will help calm you down. Um, but before skunks actually spray, they actually do three things. The first thing they do is they stomp their front feet. And if the predator doesn't listening, isn't listening to the stomping of the front feet, then they will start to bristle the tail up. And once they bristle the tail up, they're getting ready to aim. And when they aim, they actually turn their body in a U shape and then that's what they're going to spray because they're going to look and aim at the same time. And, um, and, and it's really true because I get to see it in the field. <laughs> like this morning when I went to go work with the skunk, it sprayed. I got to see, see it doing all those things. Stomp, 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 bristle the tail, U-shape. <laughs> there I was. So um, Another animal that sometimes people will see out by itself is actually a, a fawn. Oh, we have a question. Do oh. skunks eat ticks? No, no. no they, well, maybe they do, but not as popular as this, as these guys. This is, this is um, North America's only marsupial. Um, 
And so they're just like a kangaroo or a koala bear where they have a pouch where they raise their young. Brianna, you, there you yeah, are. Yeah, I love also. them. So um, another really cool thing about possums, they do look a little scary sometimes, but they're really harmless. They do eat a lot of ticks and a little pests that you have around your, your house. Uh, they also are not really susceptible to rabies. So some people are really worried about having a possum um, in around their home just because of the rabies factor. That is not a concern. Uh, their body temperature isn't really conducive to rabies. So that's a really fun fact here. Um, they have the most teeth of any land mammal. They have 50 teeth and they actually, and they play dead. And it's an involuntary um, response to fear. And it can last for a couple of minutes or a couple of hours. They have no control over how long they're playing gin for. So um, they're really unique and um, they're one of our favorites. And they are free pet control. A lot yeah. of the times when people call and say, I have an opossum under my deck, take it away. I'm like, oh, how many people would pay to have that opossum <laughs> under their deck? Because it's free pest control. But if you're you know, afraid or worried about them, then we can you know, educate what the benefits are. If you still want them evicted, we can do that all like proofing and eviction. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about deer. Um, we don't work with deer. But, we, but that doesn't mean we don't get phone calls about them. So lots of times, sometimes people will call and say, there's a fawn out under my wheelbarrow. What am I supposed to do? And actually you do nothing. Sometimes when there's animals around, you do nothing. Um, what happens is mom stashes her fawn somewhere. So um, let's say she stashed it at the wheelbarrow and you go out to do gardening and the fawn is curled up there, um, just leave it. And mom is close by. And the reason for that, the reason she stashes her young somewhere is because they don't have a smell. So predators can't smell them, but she does. So if she stays with her young, then they're more likely to get eaten by a predator. Whereas if she stashes it away, goes over here, stays over there, eats those of stuff, and comes back and takes care of them. So so that, so that, don't be surprised if you see a fawn out. One way to know if the fawn is in trouble, because we do get that you know, question, of, you know, what if it's an abandoned or an orphan fawn? Um, one thing that you can look at is their ears. The tips of their ears will start to crinkle if they become really dehydrated, and that is often a sign that they haven't been cared for for a little bit. So the mom either um, gotten hit by a car or you know something else has come come upon her so um, that's a good way to know if the ears are flat they're not crinkled that's usually just a, a fun waiting for the mom same uh, situation is with little rabbits um, often the young will be in a little nest mom goes does her work throughout the day she visits twice a day People will sometimes with the best intention say, oh, they've been abandoned, collect them all up. They may not have been abandoned. So you can take a yarn string and put an X over the nest. And if that X is disturbed, then you know the mother was there and was taking care of them. So that's um, another way to not accidentally um, orphan some young. Um, another um, common thing that can happen is you can see raccoons and skunks out during the day. Um, that, that, that is normal. Um, they're, especially during baby season, the mothers are out during the day foraging for food um, because of the demands on their bodies for nursing the young back at the den site. So um, another, another common one that we get, calls that we get are, are bats. Um, and bats, we get a lot of calls about bats in homes actually during the winter time. And what it is, is um, the, the bats are, are hibernating up in the attic space. A warm day comes, that attic warms up, and they wake up out of hibernation, and then they, they follow the airflow out of the attic, because that's how they get in and out of the attic. But lots of times they, they, they follow the airflow into the interior of the home instead of the exterior. And that also can happen during pup season. Little pups who don't know quite yet how to get out of an attic, they follow the airflow and end up inside, inside the home. So when you see a bat in your house, um, uh, 
as long as you haven't touched it or it hasn't been in a room with a sleeping person, you can open the window, the bat will fly out. But always call us first um, before you handle a bat. Please don't handle bats. Um, because we always the, call the rabies hotline too, because <laughs> they like to long where the bats are found because their species is under threat. And then um, they can give you instructions to make sure there hasn't been a possible human exposure. Are bats, are baby bats, are they called pups? Yeah. Yeah, they are called pups. Yeah, and um, a real common bat that used to be very common was the little brown bat, um, but due to white nose syndrome, uh, it's wiped out huge, uh, huge amounts of the population. So now actually the little brown bats are um, an endangered species when they used to be very common. And bat evictions can only happen certain times of the year. <laughs> It's talking in masks. <laughs> bats are um, a species that um, we help with um, wildlife grouping inside a home to keep them from coming into your um, home. But uh, we, at this time, Heart Wildlife doesn't do evictions from the home for bats. So we'll, you know, refer to a licensed um, company to manage that because of the safety issues. Anything else? Do you guys have any other questions? If you do have any other questions, feel free to pop us an email mm -hmm. at info at heartwildlifeofindia.com or give us a call and we'll try to help you out. Yeah. And we'll we'll <laughs> see them. Wealth of information. Thank you so much, Kathy says. Yes. I know I learned a lot. <laughs> awesome. Thank you all so much. We do have more uh, Helen Curry Community Education Series coming up. This was our first of this year, obviously, and hopefully we worked out some kinks for next time. So all of those events will be on our Facebook event page. Um, I believe two more are up right now. So thank you all so much for joining and hanging tight with us. Um, we really appreciate it. So <laughs> next, better luck next time. But thanks for hanging with us. Have a great evening, everybody.